वाहे गुरु 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 वाहे वाहे गुरु वाहे I would like to thank you all on behalf of Aston University Islamic Society the Christian Union the Sikh Society and the Hindu Society <coughs> who've all come together to bring this event. It's the first interfaith event of its uh, kind or concept at, held at Aston University. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the second topic uh, for tonight's discussion, which is, does religion hinder the progression of women in society, or does it provide them with opportunities? Um, if we start with Reverend Richard. It feels like a related theme, to be honest. And I'm tempted to say exactly the same thing. We've all got our mad aunts in the cupboard. No, I should say mad grand aunts. Because it's, we've all got patriarchy in our histories and in our religions. And we can use faith and belief and even, in, even our texts to do violence to women. And again, we need to take it on the chin and own up and judge and condemn when we are not treating men and women equally. And in the Christian faith, we're all created in the image of God. In Jesus, in the New Testament, St. Paul talks about, in Christ, the barrier between different ethnicities and cultures, ages and gender are broken down. And yeah, I'll hold, hold up my hand. The church, even now in parts of the world and in some quarters, will oppress women. I would want to challenge that and I want to challenge other faiths and non-faiths and say, actually, in society today, we need to hold up the equality of men and women in every area. Dr. Shabir? Uh, most of the world's uh, religions have been uh, formulated uh, many, many centuries ago, and uh, Jagraj uh, mentioned that Sikhism is the youngest of the world's uh, great religions, and, and we all know that. Uh, but, but if you think of uh, Judaism, of Christianity, of Islam, all of these were formulated a long time ago. Hinduism is said to be one of the world's uh, oldest uh, religions. Uh, in ancient societies, uh, men generally controlled power. They had the power to hunt and to fish and, to, and, and do so much of the outside work. They brought in the food, and uh, the women were generally at home caring for, for their babies. Tribes wanted to become large and powerful. Women were uh, the baby-making machines. Uh, this is how the societies were, this is how the societies were uh, governed. Uh, and, and because men controlled the power, women were um, put in their place. When, when the, uh, so to speak, I mean to use the, the ancient terminology, uh, when the world's great religions were formulated, they were formulated and, and uh, discovered and understood and interpreted by people who shared many of these patriarchal views. Uh, men in power, women in their place. It is only in our modern times that, uh, to a large extent, we came to understand the value of, of women. Uh, and uh, we are striving to the best we can to uh, bring women uh, up to the level uh, of men, to give them equal status in every way possible. And this is a good thing. Uh, but while this is an ideal, even in our modern societies where religion plays uh, a, a lesser role, such as in many of the countries of Europe, you'll be surprised to find that women are still subjected to discrimination of all sorts. Muslim women are subjected to violence. Uh, women are, are being raped and killed, sometimes by their own family members who are not necessarily religious. So what accounts for this? There is something wrong in the human psyche, there is something wrong with men that prompts them to enact violence on, on women. And this happens uh, with or without religion. Uh, but one of the great things about many of the world's great religions is that in fact they seek to uphold the value of women. Islam in particular, though 1400 years old, uh, and, and though initiated in its present form at a time when patriarchy was rife, 
did actually place a lot of emphasis on the rights of women. The fourth chapter of the Quran is called the chapter of the women uh, because it uh, delineates so much of the rights of women. Uh, babies at the time were, were being genetically selected in a crude manner. Nowadays people do it in a sophisticated manner, uh, intrauterus, but uh, in those days the baby would first be born, discovered to be a girl, and then uh, some girls were buried alive. And the Quran says that those people who did this horrible thing will be brought to justice on the day of judgment because they killed an innocent soul. Thus showing once and for all that women, like men, have every right as equal human beings to live. Women were given the right to exercise their voice in, in public uh, matters as government. Uh, women could earn money, could keep their money. Uh, women had to be given a, a, a financial uh, uh, stability, uh, a sort of financial stability when they entered into marriage. They could keep their own names as a, a, a distinct mark of their own specific identity, not to be subsumed under the husband's identity, and so on. Uh, but classical books of Islamic law always describe the rights of both uh, husbands and wives. Uh, women. Uh, as mothers are prized because when in a hadith it is said that when the Prophet was asked who deserves most of my compassion and love and respect the Prophet said your mother and the man asked again and again and the Prophet said your mother and again your mother and then the fourth time your father which in a way establishes that the mother is like three times over the, the father. Uh, so we can go on and on, but it is clear that uh, while the religions and in their present forms, the, the ancient religions were formulated at a time when patriarchy was rife, and uh, much of that patriarchy has survived in the interpretations of these great religions, it, it, it is also noticeable that a religion like Islam uh, does, uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Hanan will say something about the Jewish interpretation of religion as well, along the same lines, but uh, the, the uh, wisdom traditions go a long way to look at what is life and as much as we recognize the value of women today, Muslim theologians, Jewish theologians, Christian theologians uh, are also all struggling with their uh, theologies to, to express the equal value and, and rights of women. And in Islam, I believe we have a distinct advantage in that so much of the Quran actually establishes once and for all the rights of women. Where do I start? Um, first thing is, um, this has come a shock to a lot of you, I'm sure, but <clears throat> women are people too. Uh, we are not different. We are people. We're two genders, but we're two people. We are people. So that's the first lesson, women are people too. If the world was as suggested by you, then I think it would be wonderful, because the world has moved on. You've moved on. And I would applaud what you said. Unfortunately, the real world is not like the one you've painted. The real world is where women are not treated as people too. In fact, a survey only published yesterday showed that 44% of women in Europe have reported either sexual or physical abuse on behalf of a man. So women are still treated incredibly badly. The other problem is that women have a variety of different experiences. If a young woman is brought up in our society, and I spoke to two young Muslim women over lunch, one's trained to be a pharmacist, the other's training to be an ophthalm, I can't even say it, ophthalmologist, to do with eyes anyway. <laughs> um, religion has not held those two women back at all. They're both going to be highly qualified, they'll both be highly professional people in their jobs. That's because they're living here. Now what would happen if they were living in another society? A theocracy, a society run by religious law. We had in Birmingham not long ago the young woman called Malala, who was shot because she advocated the education of girls. Now that's in a society where the dominant rule of law was religious law. So a woman's per per uh, perception of how she's treated will depend upon where she is what religion she's in, what sect she is in, and what community is around her. I've always been an advocate of female liberation, but the problem is the liberation of women depends upon two separate things. It depends, first of all, upon women actually recognizing that they're being oppressed in some way. 
that they're being tra treated in some way different from men, that they have a role assigned to them merely because of their gender. So women have to recognize that in one way or another, they are second class citizens. The second thing is, women must be willing to do something about it. It's not my position to tell a woman how she should feel or behave or change. If she perceives that she is treated as a second class citizen, then she and other women must do something about it. They can't sit on their backsides and expect the world to do it for them. Of course they can ask for assistance, but I can only assist women in liberating themselves if they ask. The role of liberating women remains with women. But the problem, chaps, is that we're all chaps. We will allow ourselves to get away with whatever we can get away with. Men are the ones with the problem. Men are the ones who need to change. Men need to change their attitudes. Women are not doormats. They are not there to breed your children, to provide you with sex to do the housework, to till the fields. That's not their role in life. Their role is to be a person, an equal person to you, with exactly the same rights as you. We're not giving women rights. They have rights. They're people. They have rights. We are the ones with the problem. And when someone tells me that it's not fair for men to control their natural lusts about women, then it's men who need to be locked in a room away for a very long time, not women. We are the ones with the problem. And as a result of our inability to control ourselves, we create problems for women. And so I urge all young women to make the best of their lives, to make the best of their careers, irrespective of their religion, but to put up with no crap from men Very, very hard to follow that, <laughs> apart from an endorsement, well done, I do agree with you. Um, well, obviously I've been asked to give the Sikh perspective, so um, I, I very much agree with everything that was said there. Um, one of the interesting things for me from a Sikh point of view is maybe our, is our Gurus always saw themselves as Jagat Guru. Jagat means the world and Guru obviously can translate to teacher. So they saw that they, they came here to teach everybody not trying to convert people, but to teach them the wisdom. And one of the most interesting things I've seen our Gurus do is actually give every woman a sword. You know, every Amritari uh, core uh, who takes to get initiated into Khalsa then has to walk around with a weapon at all times. It's not a weapon that a man can take off her, just to carry it on her, on her body at all times, 24-7 um, effectively, she's armed. And I think that idea of arming someone is probably the most empowering thing you can do. Because it effectively means you can defend yourself. The one thing that men have always kept for themselves is that they have to protect the women. <laughs> and here Guru is saying, obviously men are bigger, they, can do the, they might be able to do the fighting at the front line, but the woman has the right to defend herself and they gave her a sword to carry. Um, another thing that the Guru said is that we are all equal, so every soul has the same mission. Which is why it confuses people when they meet someone, a, someone, a Sikh like Harjit Singh, and they think, oh, that must be a male name. And they go, <laughs> to, to, you know, 10 days later, they meet somebody called Harjit Kaur. Like, hold on, why have you got a man's name? Because all Sikh first names are unisex. And the only distinguish, distinguishing mark is if somebody is a Singh or a Kaur. And the reason for that is that the name is a spiritual name, and it has a mission. And the soul's mission for male, men and women is the same. We are both here to meet the divine. Okay? And within society, within a harmonious society, we can work together to achieve that aim. And one of the greatest uh, writers um, on Sikhism, uh, by Gurdasji, who was basically the cousin of the third, gu nephew of the third guru, and was you know hailed as a, as a great uh, Sikh spiritualist, he said that women are the door to salvation for society. And I think that you know giving people the empowering women has been what our gurus have shown us, and that's pre really what a Sikh learns from from the teacher. Um, and tries to spread that message everywhere. One of the things, uh, as I said earlier, where you talked about um, baby girls and you know, the fact that there's a lot of sex, um, sex selection going on. 
An interesting idea from the gurus was that they said that if you ever kill your daughter, Kuri Mar is called, that you are no longer a Sikh. So straight away you're outside a Sikh. The minute you kill your daughter, it's not that you will be judged, it's just that you're no longer a Sikh. Yeah, the Guru's turned his back upon you because of what you did. So, um, or you've turned your back upon the Guru. Yeah? So one of the things that obviously is happening a lot in India now, is a real shame. And it's, you have to hold your hand up and say, look, it is a Punjabi community which goes to Gurdwara and says they're sick, they do this. But because maybe they don't understand what the faith is saying. And it's really important to, to bring that point here. Um, also, one teaching is given is about pollution. Within a lot of religions, um, especially when women are menstruating, there's a lot of conditions placed upon them. They're seen as impure when they're menstruating. Uh, I know this was a very big thing in India when Gunandevji came uh, upon the earth. Um, the Gurus taught us that there's no pollution attached to a woman who is menstruating. Okay, it was just given birth. So there's no need for her to be kind of kept away from the religious part or not allowed to take part in all the services. And in fact, the fifth Guru uh, went to, to empower women further. He appointed 150 preachers and out of those, 50 of them were women. So women can preach. And I think that's a great teaching for us all to learn. Actually, at a spiritual level, women and men are equal. Women can preach, women can teach, women can get involved in even fighting. And the 10th Guru actually had a bodyguard who was a woman. I assume she was quite big and strong, but um, <laughs> she was armed and she was trained. Um, and the last bit they said for the men, quite interesting, they said, look, firstly, the man must avert his eyes. It's, the, the, it's not the woman that has to cover herself up, it's the man that must control his eyes. They said that the disease lies in the eyes of the man and not in the woman. And the second thing they said for all the, pay, for all the fathers and all the brothers out there, is you're never to eat the wealth of your sister or your daughter. So that again, empowering women to go and earn for themselves. Because obviously they meant that women can earn, but that a man should never live off the wealth of his sister or his daughter. A question for Dr. Shabir. Um, he said that Islam preaches that equality for women, yet women have to cover up, men don't. Um, women be can't become imams. Um, if you could answer my question, please. Okay, I'm just going to grab a few questions and then we'll bring it on to the panelists. Uh, there's one if you come down into the, towards the middle. I'm not trying to single out, but I do have a pressing question. And that is, here in the UK, I mean, first and foremost, I'm sure you can give me a plethora of quotations uh, regarding the respect that the Quran gives to women and that Muslims have towards women. I don't doubt that. But in the UK and in Europe, there is an inherent problem which no one is properly addressing. And that is the sexual grooming of young girls and teenagers. And, and it's... It's, it's happening and we can twist and we can try and cover up however, however much we try and want but the majority of the cases that are coming forward are from the Pakistani community. No one likes to have their religion, you know, tarnished and, no, and I understand that no one likes that but the thing is this is a problem and it's coming forward, and yet I've not seen, apart from one, I think it's the, uh, the Ramadan Foundation, apart from the Ramadan Foundation, I've not seen any other Islamic association which has come forward to provide solutions to the problem, and not just saying, we condemn it, we condemn it, we condemn it. There needs to be a proper solution to tackle this problem that we're having in the UK, which is growing, of the sexual exploitation and grooming of young girls. We have a few questions first. Um, with regards to the Pakistani community, there's nobody on the panel who is Pakistani, so <laughs> we'll just have to address it from a faith perspective. But before that, the first question is, if, if religions such as Islam claim to be equal and give rights to women, then why can't <coughs> women be imams? Or why do men not have to wear hijab, but women do? Dr. Shabir, I think that's most relevant to you for us. 
Uh, let, me, let me address the last question first, since this uh, is a more serious uh, matter. Uh, as, uh, as you rightly said, this is something that seems to affect uh, the local situation on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, but when I heard uh, of it on the other side, I, I, I was horrified by this, uh, enough to uh, make that the focus of my khutbah one, one Friday. And I happened to learn uh, from your UK newspapers that there were many imams up and down the country who had singled out that Friday right after the news hit. Uh, to make that the, the focus of their khutbas as well, mainly to condemn this. In addition to that, uh, on one of our television episodes aired in Canada, I also spoke uh, against this, uh, the, the sexual grooming of young girls, uh, and I condemned that as being totally un-Islamic. Uh, now, your question though is, can we go beyond this condemnation to do something practical on the ground? And uh, if I were here, I don't know what I might have done, uh, to, uh, but but de definitely something needs to be done on the ground. As, as Maruf noted, there is no representative for the Pakistani community, but, but even that is not a representative, that, that's not the representative Pakistani issue. It, it is a community issue, it is an issue right here in this country, it, it is this country's issue, it, it is a legal issue, uh, it is something for the law enforcement officials to deal with, and to deal with severely to make sure that this problem is rooted out. Did anybody ever claim that this is done on behalf of their religion? I don't think so. Did anybody ever say that this is done on behalf of Pakistani identity? I don't think so. So it is a problem, and I, as Mike pointed out earlier, there is a problem with men who do things like this. Uh, and as uh, Jadraj uh, pointed out earlier in the religious teachings, th this is actually acknowledged. Uh, it, it is actually acknowledged in the Quran that there are men in whose hearts there is a disease. So yeah, th there are men with diseases in, in their hearts. Uh, now that takes me to the next question. Why, what, what is this thing about the hijab of women covering up in a particular way? Uh, well, uh, as uh, Jagraj said again, I, I'm quoting you a lot here, Jagraj, yeah? Okay. I'm, I'm listening. Will, uh, I'm listening. <laughs> There is a prescription also in, in religion about men averting their glances. In fact, when the Quran spoke about this in Surah Nur, the 24th chapter in the 30th verse, before even talking about clothing, the Quran says, tell the believing men that they should avert their glances and they should guard their private parts. So the, the men were being told, first of all, to avert their glances and to cover themselves up before the Quran even addressed the women about this. So the men need to lower their gazes. It's not so much that the women are a problem. It, it is that the men who have diseases in their hearts might be affected even if a woman talks to her, even though she means all uh, to talk in a normal and business-like manner, but he starts having hopes and intentions uh, of, of an evil kind. You see? Uh, and you know it happens, right? Um, part of it is human nature, and this goes back to what uh, uh, scientists will describe as our biological inheritance. Uh, and men have this tendency, they say, to spread their genes around, and so they're always looking for more opportunities. And, but if, if we recognize that, we know why it is important that we follow the Islamic teachings, that you do avert your glances, and you do the best you can to control uh, your uh, desires. Uh, the, the prescriptions for men, therefore, is that men should also have decent clothing. It's both decent clothing for men and decent clothing for women. But in various societies, the idea of what is decent clothing varies. Uh, but in most societies, it is generally recognized that m women would cover more than men. Even in, in Canada, on, on a hot sunny day, people will go on the beach, and they usually uh, a man would be there just in his swimming trunks. Uh, so he's wearing one piece of clothing, but it's generally expected that women will be wearing two pieces of clothing, uh, at least. And, and, and even though it is actually legally, it, it is legally allowed in Canada for a woman to bear, bear her breasts in public. Uh, this actually became a test case when a woman, uh, 23 years old, bravely one day walked uh, on, on, a, on a public road uh, with, with her top off. Just, just to challenge the law, and it was actually ruled in her favor. Uh, and I thought that after that, man, this is going to be terrible. A lot of people are going to now uh, act on this. But people generally don't act on that because people have an inner sense 
that even if the law allows you to do that, it, it doesn't really make sense to do that. Uh, so, in, in Muslim societies, in traditional societies generally, uh, men also cover themselves uh, almost fully. If you look at... Uh, I'm getting to that, I'm getting to that. Um, uh, so, men generally cover themselves uh, quite a lot as well. I mean, what I'm wearing is a very traditional Muslim sort of clothing. And you can see that... <laughs> <laughs> and, and as you know, some men, like especially in Saudi Arabia, also drape uh, a shawl over their, their heads. And that got guards from the heat of the sun and, and from the blowing sand and so on. So traditional societies were like that. Both men and women covered themselves extensively. Uh, as for women being imams, uh, this... Uh, became a subject of hot discussion a few years ago, uh, especially when uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto uh, wrote a paper uh, arguing that women can be imams. And uh, she, uh, in defense of that thesis, uh, drew on some uh, snippets from Islamic tradition and from the ethos of the Quran in general. She put forward a good argument, and that argument has been challenged by some others. Uh, some disagreeing with her and some agreeing with her. In my, my own evaluation of that subject, I find that, again, we must always go to the Quran as our main source and then to other sources as secondary uh, and derivative and explanatory sources. In the Quran, there is nothing that actually prevents a woman from being imam. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in the derivative sources and in the secondary sources, we find, for example, in the Hadith, that it, what defines an imam is, does not require that the imam be male. It is actually a traditional thing in Muslim society handed down for generations that the imams have generally been male. But uh, the, the, the main qualification of an imam in prayer is that the imam should be the one who is more well versed in the, in the Quran and in the rules regarding the prayers. And there should be nothing uh, inherent in the imam that, that leads to a question as to whether the, the imam's prayer would be accepted. So the community should have the confidence that when we stand behind this imam to pray, the imam's prayer is accepted, and by virtue of that, our prayers are also accepted. And not only by virtue of that, but that being one of the, um, one of the prerequisites of the con congregational prayer or of appointing the imam. Let me be more specific. It is possible that the imam's prayer is not accepted, but the prayer of the congregant is, is accepted. But most congregants have this sense that uh, I am an unworthy follower, I'm just going there, I'm joining in the group, maybe by the, uh, the, the shared experience of the whole group, God's mercy will be on us and me, a humble uh, person, will also receive some of that. And we expect that the Imam should be the epitome of what it means to be a Muslim. So, that has nothing to do with gender, because women are equally spiritual as men. In fact, when the Quran spe it speaks uh, about women and <coughs> men, the Quran speaks about them as being equally responsible before God and equally recipients of God's divine mercy and blessings. But in traditional society, people would not have accepted a woman to be an Imam, and this is probably why, uh, through Islamic history, it has been commonplace for men to be Imams uh, over men. And it was thought that women can be Imams uh, if the congregation is all women. So that shows that the woman can lead a prayer and her prayer will be accepted. So I find nothing inherent in the tradition that specifically prevents a woman from being uh, an, an Imam. And it generally, in Islamic law, uh, something, in order for somebody to say that something is either obligatory or prohibited, one has to have a proof text. One has to have either something that is mentioned in the Quran, or something that is mentioned explicitly by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in an authentic hadith. Failing that, one cannot make up a rule on his own and say that this thing is obligatory or that thing is, uh, is prohibited. We might, on the other hand, do it on the basis of reason. Thank but nobody argues I'm on this basis. Um, before I go to my uh, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna bring in the guest because it's you. Excuse me. Uh, Sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I don't think you answered my questions fully. Um, what I'm trying to get at is that in the Sikh community, if we were to have a problem, we would stamp it out because for us, our honour as a community, as the Khalsa, means is paramount to us because our faith teaches us that we are the face of the Guru. 
and any 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 kind of tarnish that goes onto this turban is onto the turban of our guru. Now, I work very closely with the, uh, with some of the, with uh, within the community, and I'm finding that we're having to do a lot of the legwork with regards to these grooming and this sexual, uh, you know, all this that's going on. We're doing that legwork with our girls, with our community, and I'm not seeing that. And I, and I appreciate that he said that. Yes, even I remember that one Friday Kutba was dedicated to this issue. But for something that's been going on for the past 10, 20 years, do you really think one Kutba on one Friday on one occasion is going to cut it? And I, when I say solutions, I mean this isn't about creating a religious tension or a community okay. tension. We want that solution. Okay, I think the, the points we made. If I could just pass this over to uh, Mike first to address both questions, the one about imams and the one about sexual grooming. Um, uh, referring to your question about uh, uh, the grooming of young women. Let's be absolutely clear, it's it, clear that it takes place outside Islam and outside the Pakistani community. Right? So, this is not actually a religion related phenomenon. However, there is a religion, religion related explanation. And it's religions are always happiest when they're controlling the bedroom. Now, the Catholic Church has always been very strong when it's controlled people's reproductive rights and the rights of women to bear children or not bear children. I think there are a number of religious communities where the attitude towards sex is very unhealthy. If every boy expects to marry a virgin, but if every boy expects to be experienced when he gets married, who does he screw? So there's an unhealthy attitude towards sex in all religious communities, both sexes, want to engage in relationships with the opposite sex. And yet, in some communities, it's absolutely forbidden that there should be any sexual relationship outside marriage. This is actually very unhealthy, because it leads to monstrous amounts of testosterone running around the world, causing trouble, and that's men. So there are ways that religion can overcome this by teaching a much more healthy attitude towards sex and sexual relations. In terms of imams and not imams, don't pick on Islam. Because the same thing is applied to Christianity, it's applied to all religions. The representatives of religion sitting here today, including me, and I'm not religious, are men. Where are the women? Look at the fight that's been going on in the Church of England about priests and bishops. That's still not been resolved. So it's not just a problem of Islam. So neither the sexual problem is just a problem of Islam, nor the priesthood is just a problem of Islam, but they are both related to the role of men wanting to maintain their dominance within religious belief. So uh, the points were raised, uh, I want to acknowledge the fact that both the points were raised by Sikhs, and the reason it was, I think, was because this is an issue that's important to us, and I want to just take issue with what Mike just said about it being a religious issue. Not all religions are the same. Sikhs do not believe that women cannot lead the congregation. But I've been in many congregations where women have been the leaders at the front doing Ardas or doing the Kirtan or doing Katha. However, there is tradition in there is there are male dominated cultures, okay? And no one can say that, that doesn't happen and obviously there is suppression of women in all in all cultures, especially the Punjabi culture happens to be a one which is like that, but less so than other cultures. When it comes to the exploitation and the sexual exploitation of women, I actually addressed this in a talk in Southall, because we do a talk every, every Sunday, I do a talk from 6 to 7 p.m. at Southall Gurdwara, and I address this the exact topic. When it comes to sexual grooming um, of women, yes, one of the reasons that it happens is because within the Pakistani community, okay, it's not seen that they're allowed to uh, engage in sexual relations with other women of their community, it's not allowed. So your point there is very valid, that there are people that are very frustrated. I think part of this comes back to what I said earlier about being a, a doctor and a disease. There is this disease, however, most of society will say that disease is not curable. Right? So that if there's a disease that can't be cured, then we must contain it, or we must allow it to be spread in a certain area, and, allow it, and then allow it free reign within an area, which is what you were suggesting, that allow the testosterone to flow, but have a more healthy attitude towards sex. We do not believe in sex before marriage. However, we do believe that the five things that we all suffer from are lust, anger, greed, pride and attachment. And all of these five can be 
cured, not cured, cured and can be treated by the connection to the divine. So which we call naam. So if someone was to connect to the divine through sifat salaha for, the Islam, for Islam, to zikr, to praying, meditating upon God's name, chanting God's name, these things would be cured because we're giving ourselves the medicine of God's name. Yeah? Har har naam okhad mukh deva. We are supposed to have the medicine of God's name. Much, much of these problems here are, are treating human beings as very mundane and as unable to control themselves and always needing rules. But actually, if we address what a human being is, what they are is a light of God. And if they were to start to reconnect with where they come from, then many of the diseases which stem from ego, which stem from home maybe call it, ego, a separation from the divine, the connection cures the separation. And these diseases cease to be so powerful. So I'm sorry I have to leave now because I was told it's from 3 to 5 and I'm from London, but in conclusion I would say that the solution needs to be society needs to start connecting back with the Divine and in, if it's a, a community like for example the Pakistani community that's committing a lot of these offences then I do think that you know the point there was valid that there needs to be a stronger response from the leaders of that Pakistani community because as we saw that from that program I think it was Mason Birmingham, was it Mr. Khan, the community leader yeah? Those community leaders, they need to lead the communities. A lot of community leaders spend their time trying to become community leaders, but not leading anybody. This is a problem of nearly of, of community leaders from India in the first place, or Asia. They want to be community leaders, but they don't want to lead anybody. And this is a time for you to step up. If you're a leader, then lead. Yeah? And stamp this thing out. And yes, I do believe that Pakistani community can do much more about that issue.